Alright, alright, alright. Inna alhamdulillahi wa kafah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulih al-mustafa wa ala ibadhi al-lazhi nartaba wa man bi hudahum ihtada wa bi athari ahli al-madina taqtafa wa ba'ad fa salamu allahi ala al-qawm ahlam wa sahlam bikum people marhaban So, shukran, shukran those of you turning up Let's just see if this is running live. I take it it is. All right, all right. It's it's operational, people. So, right. What we can do actually, we could take some uh, questions. I wanted to today as well. Shortly, I won't do it straight away, but go over this debate that everybody's been on about. Have you guys watched this debate? Yeah. Who's who's watched it? Let's have a show of hands. The David Woods versus uh, Muhammad Hijab. All right, few people. That it. Seriously, not even the highlights. You haven't. Rest of you, not even. Look at that. Your brother's like. I got half of it. Yeah, yeah, half of it gives you a good, a good um, idea of what's going on. But um, I want to go over that. A, a kind of, some reflections and analysis. Trying to be objective. But I'll let some people tune in. We could take some questions. Look at that. Muad is not Muad here. Is he messaging from there? <laughs> I just left a debate with Sheikh Asrar. Huh? Who said? Oh, was the atheist one? Oh, right. It was, did Sheikh Asrar have a debate today? Did he? Yeah, with some atheist guy. Ah, how did that go? Anybody? Any feedback? <laughs> Meanwhile, there's been an interesting challenge set up to Sheikh Asrar. <laughs> Has he responded? Yeah, he's just said that, yeah, okay, let's do it. All right, Nike, let's do it. <laughs> That's it. So he's, uh, that was an out of the blue kind of, have you guys seen that challenge? I, I had it, somebody sent it to me, I was like, oh, this is a bit out of the blue, but uh, so it's going straight back to the good old Diobandi Brilvi days, huh? <laughs> gonna have some <laughs> clash and interesting so let's see that'll be interesting right so what is on people's mind I'm slightly struggling to see some of the please talk about what the right hand possesses <laughs> <laughs> right everybody <laughs> hands out of your pockets <laughs> Oh, right hand. Oh, not left hand. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so, does it matter? Right, left. Right, left. Is that uh, what right hand possesses? Look, Billy's kind of like, <laughs> that's one of my keen topics. <laughs> uh, where is the Diet Coke? Exactly, I'm waiting on the, uh, the, the drinks. I'm going to have to look at this. See? This is, this is what happens, people. This is what happens when I go live from an actual place. <laughs> so, right, let's actually, what, what are on your, what are the, what's on your mind, people? Any thoughts, any interesting um, things that maybe we could maybe discuss first? Look at that, brother. Keen. Allah. Mati'ur Rahman, isn't it? I'm doing it. You do. It. Oh, shukran, shukran. <laughs> Allah, Allah. <laughs> All right, people. Fear not. The Pepsi Max is here. Naam, mutiya. Off one, off one. Is there any news on the uh, classes on Usul Hadith? Acha, acha, acha. Mashallah. Keen student, keen student. No, no, that's good. That's good. Uh, I mean, had some distractions, but it's it's good. So I want to I want to actually begin with something like Usul Hadith. So soon, soon come, soon come. Right, so inshallah. What, what, what are some of the, what's on your mind, people? Look at that. <coughs> the broad. I have two questions. Uh, two questions. Yes, yeah. yeah, salam. The first question is uh, Surah number 9, verse 30. Surah what? Nile? Surah 9. Okay. Surah I thought, what? Surah, surah Nile? Surah 9. <laughs> oh, in the... But he's saying that, why did Allah use the definite article of Yahud? Sorry, why did Allah use this? Yeah, Allah, why did you use the? Is that the? Is that why did Allah say Al? Is that the? No, the question is basically uh, this statement: the Jews say Uzair is the son of God. Yeah, yeah. Historic is not historical record. Mm. So the Quran has made a mistake. Oof. 
Yes, yeah, salam. What's up, uh, just repeat the question for the live Yeah, so right now, <coughs> the question is that the Jews, it, the verse of the Quran that the Jews say that Uzair is uh, Ibn Allah and the, the Christians say that Masih is the Son of God. And the Jews in this verse of the Quran, Allah is saying that the Jews say Uzair is the Son of God. But the reality is that Uzair is not the Son of God. I mean, not only is he not the Son of God, but the fact that the Jews don't worship Uzair. This is the, the question, isn't it? Uh, this is slightly misunderstood. Okay, this is slightly misunderstood. Uh, and you, it's better to actually, oh right, I don't have my other phone with me. But it's better to read the entire context, the verses before this as well and after. Allah then continues to speak about this, uh, about the incident. People here assume that Allah is accusing the Jews of worshipping, like having a similar to a trinity kind of concept. That's not the case. Allah is not saying that and he's never said that in the Quran. The Jews, whenever they are addressed, Allah does not address them as you claim that there's, you know, such and such that Allah took a son. That, for example, in Malai Takhada, you know, Waladan or something. This, this, this is never the case with the Jews. So what is it about Uzair that Allah is harsh on? And this is according to Jewish sources as well. Shows that Uzair was most likely the, the scholar, the prophet, responsible or the special figure responsible uh, sorry not prophet but the special figure responsible in Jude um, what he declared could be part of the book of God was the book of God what he so this authority that he has and the way the Jews then go on to defend him the the Israelites of his time and those the generations that come after the way they kind of uh, um, venerate him so that the kind of maqam he has was as though he's that special as though he's like a child of god so this is what it is otherwise the quran never um addresses ever and it addresses the jewish people on so many occasions ya bani israel ya bani israel it never uh, kind of levies this allegation against them that you, that allah in allah takhada waladan for example that allah has taken a son that is never the case. This verse is misunderstood about what Uzair uh, does. And you do have other verses in Surah Baqarah that the Jews say that we are Abna'ullah. That the Jews say, Nahnu Abna'ullahi wa ahibba'u. That we are the beloved and the children of God. So they did have this context where they use these terms. So it's not, and some people have tried to critique Islam about this said heart that Islam's got it wrong that's not the case although true if you did not have the Quran in context and you only had this verse this was the only verse you saw of the Quran you could draw that conclusion that oh Muslims thought that Jews used to worship uh, oh sorry that Jews uh, yeah, worshipped a son of God as well um, but when you read the whole Quran and so much of it addresses Bani Israel, the Israelites, and a huge, in fact, one could argue that a huge portion of the Medinan surahs, the Madani surahs, are really kind of directed partially towards the Jewish people because in Medina there were no Christians. There were Jews and there were the other Arabs and, and Muslims. And, but there wasn't, the Christians usually were slightly distant and they would visit. So a lot of the Ahlul Kitab message in the Medinan Surah is actually towards the Jewish people. So it's not that the Muslims weren't aware of this and they had no access, they did. So this is misunderstood, that's not what the verse is saying. But that's a good, it's, it's true, it's, it can be a slightly confusing uh, point if you don't know the context. And, but it's a good question. Good question. What's that one question on the live? Uh, we'll just mix it up here. Yeah? So you guys have your question. As well. So Elizabeth, on, Elizabeth is asking, how do we respond to the issue regarding Banu Huraiza? And uh, so, <coughs> what, what should be the Muslim response? Because they're saying that, you know, uh, the Prophet massacred 
Mm. I did say that I was going to do on the incident of Wani Khureza, I was going to do a detailed kind of response, which I haven't done yet. I did it on the other incidents of the marriage of Sophia, and I did a few other uh, the the allegation that the uh, that the Prophet massacred elsewhere or did certain other things. I've done those on Bani Khureza. I still haven't done that, but in short, I will do that. Inshallah, a detailed where I bring up the actual narrations and go through them and show why they are unacceptable we have to understand first of all how do we know something about uh, islamic history a lot of it is based on people uh, like you're going to have ibn ishaq you're going to have uh, al-waqidi these kind of people are utterly unreliable when it comes to narrations now i know people do accept from them in certain things like they say oh but we want to accept the maghazi or we want to accept this but you got to remember these people are not reliable i mean ibn ishaq imam malik said about him he's a, a dajjal he's somebody who that's the kind of maqa, you know the, the position that imam malik <coughs> placed him in so and imam malik said that if i stood you know between the kaaba and the rukn al jaman i would take by, like by the kaaba i would take an oath uh, by God and say that this person is a Dajjal and that he's a deceiver he's you know you can't really be taking that's my first my first point secondly a lot of these narrations are are massively um, or this incident is massively exaggerated so when they speak about Bani Khureza they the kind of reports that they present that so many people got massacred and all of this uh, it's just not true that it didn't happen like that. That's not to detract from an incident. There was an incident that did take place at Bani Khureza, and there was, um, I mean, people did die, but not in the numbers that are presented. If you look at the stories that of Bani Khureza, they say because the, the Muslims, they go there because of what uh, Bani Khureza had done to violate their treaty. So... It's to do with the Battle of the Trenches and that the entire, most of Medina is surrounded by this trench and there's some um, which the Muslims have dug because the kind of coalition forces have come upon them. So you had the major tribes of Arabia, joint forces, Ghatfan and Quraysh and all these other people and they came and um, I believe Hawazin and other people as well and they, and they attacked Medina. Now... What really was of support to them uh, was the in, like to have somebody like a fifth column from within or somebody from behind on that side of the territory. And that was these Jewish tribes of Bani Nadir, of Bani Quraitha and people like this that had a treaty with the Muslims. Now they violated it. They did try to tell some kind of, oh, there might be a weakness in the trench on this end if you sneak in through here. And there was an attempt for several days, but because of the, the kind of weather and the sandstorm, eventually the armies kind of dispersed. But had of they gained entry into Medina, it would have been a complete wipeout. It would have been a genocide of every individual in Medina, man, woman and child. I mean, everybody would have been massacred. There was no, it was no mercy. And the worst thing was that here was a sacred treaty that Bani Khureyta uh, renege on. They, they, they kind of say, well, you know, here's an opportunity. Let's do over the Muslims. Now, in that incident, when the Prophet does go there, he actually gives them a chance and says that, who would you prefer that gives you uh, judgment? And they actually choose Sa'ad because he was from them. And the Prophet actually says in the famous hadith, you know, Qumu ila Sayyidi, come stand to your Sayyid. And Sa'ad is the one that says, oh, I want these people executed. And he, and then that is carried out. The Prophet does not say that. But that said, even if you look at these narrations, the narrations say things like, oh, they, they massacred, like they will say hundreds and hundreds of people. And then they dug up their graves and then they returned back to Medina. And then they got back to Medina and did this... All this within a short afternoon, like within Asr time. They did all of it. It's just inconceivable and impossible that all of these actions were conducted within that. 
the, the time span that they're saying. That's not to say that nothing happened, that there was an incident of Bani Quraitha, and there was this betrayal, and there was a consequence that did happen. And Sa'ad did instruct that he did judge, chosen by them, to say that I want them executed, these people who've betrayed. Um, and so that's the summary. It did happen. Um, but it wasn't the Prophet, it was Sa'ad. But the point being, these numbers have been kind of grossly exaggerated as well over the time. So you will see some people, some historians that have given those uh, numbers are unreliable. Okay, I hope that sums it up for now. What I'd like to do in the future is bring the key narrations and um, go into this and show you uh, some of this then. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, by the way, Muhammad Hijab is watching us. I can give him salam. Muhammad Hijab, ahlan wa sahlan, ahlan wa sahlan. I wanted to go over, inshallah, your, um, your debate. So, inshallah, do my thoughts and reflections. Do stay tuned. Shukran, shukran. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum salam. Thank you for the invitation. Allah, most welcome, ma'am. Uh, my question is... Uh, yeah, get the brother a cup of... A cup. No, no. <laughs> 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 my question is according to Amir Kuzda, he explained uh, like, with regards to Prophet Musa alayhi salam, uh, his stick did he transform into a snake? Mm -hmm. My question is with regards to um, Surah Yusuf, verse 19. Ah, changing Prophet already. <laughs> um, the, the English translation is, no, uh, take it. this, my shirt and cast it over the face oh. of my father he will become seen and bring me your family all together so he was obviously bl blinded to existing weeping and then mm -hmm. this miracle obviously that dominantly uh, Sunni scholars follow is that the shirt was the miracle that he cured his father's blind blindness but how mm. do you explain that okay i did want to actually touch up on some miracles a bit later on um uh, because i want to that as a follow-on discussion to uh, my uh, thoughts on the, on the debate matter as well. So, I mean, should I tie it in then? I think it might be a bit, uh, a bit better rather than coming back and forth. But the question is that, uh, you said about, what's that got to do with Musa alayhi salam? No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just referencing Musa salam. Could you explain okay. um, to Sadiq bin that obviously it wasn't... Actually... Okay, so here we've got the incident of... Yusuf yeah. alayhi salam Isn't sending his shirt yes. and uh, according to it there's a miracle so yes. okay cool right so miracles inshallah I'll touch upon right I think um, cool shall we any other yeah. pro go on then we'll take another question then we'll begin I mean I want to share my thoughts on the, the debate thing as well so okay. but let's so, take some Safa yeah. is asking that uh, there's a lot of confusion for laymen because okay. uh, a scholar may say something is halal and the other scholar may say something completely opposite, say it's haram, for example. How do we know who to follow? Because there's a difference of halal and haram. So let me just rephrase that question, that there's a lot of confusion for laymen, right? For that, they, that one scholar may say something is halal, another may say something is haram. Who should we follow? Follow me. Anal <laughs> 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 haq. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Mansur al Hallaj all over again. <laughs> so, right, now that's a um, good question. Good question. Um, although I've already answered it. <laughs> but uh, that's a good question. I think there will always be that diversity, that difference of opinion, that uh, in many things that's a good thing. In some things it can be quite confusing and problematic. I accept that. Um, I would say that, look, it's, it's tricky because do you then end up endorsing everything? Do you, which I wouldn't, because by extension, if we're going to say, truly speaking, everything is valid, uh, then that would extend to all kinds of groups, the Khawarij, it would extend to the Khawarij, it would extend to things like, you know, uh, ISIS and all these people who also have Islamic opinions. Their opinions are also based on, you know, some understanding of the Quran. It's not that. So how do you kind of draw the line? What I would say is that, well, there is, there is an interesting hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said 
that uh, and there is some kalam on its on its chain but the the point is the the content is interesting that the prophet said that istafti qalba that you what resonates when you have this kind of confusion what resonates with your heart that what do you feel falls in line with the holistic message the message of compassion that this deen has um, if you feel that something if you have an array of opinions and something resonates with you you can take that okay uh, generally speaking as long as there is no harm being inflicted on others as a result of this of this opinion of as a result of this question then i feel that fiqhi opinions in general there is scope to 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 move through them to maneuver through them so as so long as you're not causing actual harm to somebody if you are causing harm then it becomes an intricate matter because you can't just be you know declaring certain somebody's property for example null and void <coughs> just because there's an opinion so you know you can't do things like that and I, and i would say that what is important to remember if i could give some guidelines i would say at all time remember that this deen came with maqasid okay that it came for the preservation of five key things that for the preservation of nafs of life deen al aql reason and intellect progeny that the survival of societies communities and hum- and mankind and uh al mal and wealth so because and one may say well how can wealth in there um that's a bit capitalist <laughs> but it's it's not because really these are the things although it's a social construct but it's something that helps it, it makes it motivates mankind to get things done it is you know one of the key factors and islam does seek to preserve people's wealth right so i would say that so that keep these things in mind always keep in mind that the deen came for the welfare of people and then you may choose and it is permissible to choose things of ease <coughs> the deen is one of ease a deenu yusr as the hadith says that the deen is one of ease if you have a choice you can choose an option of ease that's i'm now kind of like Uh, honing in on this whole question in trying to say well if it's a simple islamic question to do with i want to pray or want to do this and i want to do that and there's uh, a set of opinions and one of them's easier you can take it okay that in my understanding that's absolutely fine the prophet was never given a choice except he chose the easier of all options available we'll take one more and then, then you can start yourself. all right cool one more yeah more and then people what Allahu Akbar. Like what's what's <laughs> detention? You <laughs> almost reminded everybody of like stand up, young man. Yeah. Now, nah, what's what's your name again? Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Ibrahim from Coventry. Ibrahim from Coventry. Doing it, people. Doing Becoming it. Becoming a mufti next year. Becoming a mufti next year. Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Light year. Light year. <laughs> what's the question? Yeah, sorry. What's the question? Yeah. Uh, first, if I can just thank you because you helped me with my faith. Oh, yeah. Shukran. Hayak Allah. Hayak. My question is, um, can we understand the four, four, the four, 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 and like the Sahabat in terms of language? So the, language. the Quran. Yes, because yeah, okay. if we read their language and read uh, stories about. how when they heard the quran they were like oh my god they 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 it has to be the word of allah so can we reach that 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 can we well? reach that level of understanding as yeah. in, in are you talking in terms of comprehension are you talking no, in no. terms of in terms of the the that in, in terms of the language the language yeah. just understanding the language yeah. yes of course i mean our uh people understand many people understand the quran today they understand its arabic perfectly i mean there's no i mean i'm sure people are on a spectrum some people obviously better than others but people the arabic language of the quran uh, is understood by anybody who studied uh, uh, you know al arabiyatul fusha clear classic arabic 
Um, now that doesn't mean that more deeper meanings may un may not unfold with time. They will. So as you read the Quran, certain meanings may unfold to you with time. That does happen. And then there are certain words in the Quran that even one could argue even when it was revealed, there was some um, confusion over what they may have meant in the sense of amongst people. So, I mean, there's some words that nobody, like let's just say like the huruf al muqatta'at alif lam meme and stuff like this. They don't really have a meaning. But even certain words like, let's say, um, let's just say things like, uh, like when Allah addresses Musa alayhi salam in, uh, what is it? Uh, that when Musa is in the valley, bil wadil muqaddasituwa, that you are in this sacred valley, tuwa. Now, what did tuwa actually here mean? And so some people said, oh, is that a name of the place? Or no, does it mean this? Or does it mean this? Or some people said it was taken from this language. And some, and you get that on a few occasions. And there's books written to written on this kind of topic saying, um, are there words in the Quran that were non-Arabic and then Arabicized and stuff like this? But my, to sum it up, yes, people, many people, you can learn how to understand the Quran. It's not a, a difficult journey. You could, uh, re, you could learn Arabic within six months. Within six months to a year, you already know Allah. Allah. <laughs> do, do you know it to that level that you were asking about? That, like the Sahaba no. level. <laughs> no, I'm just, but inshallah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, may we all understand it like that. But the question was, because I thought you might have been asking, there was another angle to that question is, when we read certain thing, when we read certain stories today, like let's say somebody asked about miracles, when we read this today and the companions read it, did they understand the same things we understand today? Did they understand something different? Um, that truly we don't know, because uh, a lot of the tafasir and stuff like this for the Quran from the early sources is usually very weak and unreliable. It's not actually like the chains that go back in hadith. It's not. Like, for example, most of the tafsir of Ibn Abbas or most of these are not really reliable sources. So we don't really. It's like some of the ex-Muslims have asked. I remember I presented an understanding and they said uh, somebody had asked me, yes, you're saying this like you'd asked earlier on about Musa salam throwing the stick. And, and I've said in my explanation that uh, in some verse of the Quran, it says Ka'annahu, like as though it was a snake. Now. Somebody had said, yeah, but what did the companions of the Prophet understand by this? And the truth is, we, we don't know. Because we know that this is the Qur'an, but what was their subjective understanding at the time? Because it didn't become a discussion that was so huge. It, we don't know. We can just go by what the message was. And then we've got some inherited understanding to guide us, if that makes sense. Cool, people. Yep. Yeah, um, just one question before you get on to that Kill discussion. Uh, somebody called Do is asking. Did, Do. Yeah. Did Zuhri do Tadlis? Did Z Zuhri do Tadlis? Zuhri, huh? Shahabuddin Zuhri. Generally, we do respect, obviously, highly Imam Zuhri. He was one of the dons of Medina and one of the <laughs> teachers of Imam Malik. However, Imam Imam Zuhri was a uh, Oh, shukran, shukran. Imam Zuhri was a, a major, what I, I would call a powerhouse of hadith, as in one of the key people that transmits so many hadith. So there's a few of them. I mean, there's, there's some key people you will hear their names repeatedly. People like Zuhri, people like uh, Ibn Juraj, people like um, Qatada, A'mash. Um, these kind of people and other figures, they're like powerhouses, as in from them stem loads of uh, narrations like they really these people are like your broadband version of hadith coming down so when it comes to them it zooms out and then people after them are just the olden day dial-up kind of system it's very they're not as these guys are the main uh, uh, vents of hadith Zuhri was also the first person commissioned to document 
hadith when he did by Umar ibn Abdul Aziz when he did so he never did it with chains that was not the request at the time the chain collection began after him um, now and although he may have witnessed that he dies if I'm correct I think he dies in 124 Hijri or something like that now Imam Zuhri one problem with him is uh, that he's a major modalis <laughs> He's a <laughs> mutallis is somebody that when you present chains of hadith, like sorry, so when we're saying, so I'm going to say I heard something from, let's say I heard it from I Ibi, who heard it from Irfan, who heard it from, let's say Nav. Now that's a chain. But the problem is that because Ibi is so, Ibrar, isn't it? Ibrar is so, uh, popular mashallah amongst people and so let's just say now he has a really bad reputation so nobody really wants to take anything from him I have no idea why they'd want to do that to you Ibrar, but let's just assume it's something to do with your personality <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> so what I mean by it <laughs> sorry sorry I need to sober up people so the so let, let's just say for whatever reason now, so what I do is because I have also met Irfan, who I have at times taken things from, but this particular thing, I'm, I haven't heard it directly from Irfan, I've heard it through Ibrar, then Irfan. But what I choose to do is drop his name. And I just say from Irfan, from Nav, that this was said. Now people will say, oh yeah, but you know, Mufti knows Irfan, yeah, so he must have heard it directly from him. So without me saying the word I heard directly from, I imply, I allow to mislead you in you thinking that I heard this directly. And at the same token, I haven't <coughs> lied. I've misled. So there's a difference. One is I clearly say, I heard this from him when I didn't. So that's lying. One is I mislead you into thinking that I'm saying that. So I just say, yeah, you know, one day Irfan said, now I don't say I heard it, he said it to me, I just say he said. So you assume I heard this directly from him because I know him and we're contemporaries and we've met. But the truth is this has come through somebody else who is unreliable and I've dropped that person in the chain, from the chain. This is called Tadlis. As shocking as this is, Surprisingly, scholars have accepted it. I mean, it's so, some people like Imam Shu'ba, who is also a powerhouse of Hadith, he, he claimed, he was very strict against Tadlis and used to deem it haram. Shu'ba used to say Tadlis was haram. Anybody who does that has committed a sin. But other scholars seem to be kind of more forgiving towards Tadlis and that's quite shocking in, in my eyes, but nevertheless, so Imam Zuhri is a major mudallis and Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani in his uh, book of mudallisin places him in the uh, tabaqat al-thalitha from the third category, which is the least, that you can write their hadith, but you can't use it as evidence unless he clearly says, I heard. And by the way, sometimes, so there's two layers to this trick. Layer one for the for the normal people is just saying, you know, he said like, I'm from this person and I'm hoping you guys are going to take the bait. You're going to say, oh, an, he must have heard it from him. So in Arabic, they use the word an as in ain nun, which means kind of from or on the authority of. Now, then there's another for the advanced players. He realizes this ain't going to cut it. So he plays, he ups the game. So he uses words like Akhbarana that he has informed us and people like Zuhri still play the game on Akhbarana as well. Him, Ibn Juraj, uh, these people are notorious with Akhbarana. So they will, Akhbarana means he told me, like he informed me. So the normal word that scholars of Hadith use is Haddathana, he spoke it to me. So they will avoid that word because they don't want to lie. But they'll say, Akhbarana, he informed me. And what that means is, 
Oh, I read it in his book. He had a book. And I read it in there. He never told me whether the book was right or wrong. But he informed me via a book. You understand? So it's the equivalent today of saying, if I said, you know, so and so, if I said something like, let's just say I said something like, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf informed me that uh, we should do things like this and this. And then somebody said, oh, wow, are you in community? In I mean, do you communicate with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf? And I said, well, no, he informed me via his Facebook status. <laughs> this is the equivalent. Of what they were doing. This was the advanced layer. This was when you know game. Not, what is it? Skill nine thousand or something. Or this was uh, so a lot of people would think, oh, Akbar and is okay, but it wasn't. Um, this was used wrongly used as well. So Zuhri does do that a lot. Um, we have to be weary of a lot of narrations from Zuhri. Uh, this is why Imam Malik, who is the I mean, if you get all the narrators from uh, Imam Zuhri, the most reliable is who? Imam Malik. They say, Athbatun Nas fi Zuhri, Malik. And yet, Imam Malik only transmits about, what, 300 hadith from him? And, you know, when Imam, uh, when Imam Malik had passed away, they, they have found a large kind of uh, container, which they opened up, and it had so many hadith in there from Zuhri, which he hadn't transmitted. So he was very weary as well, Imam Malik was, about what, although he did respect Imam Zuhri in his own right, but he was very weary what he transmitted. A question that's linked to Zuhri here is that, uh, did he have a political agenda? Because he seems to be narrating some anti umawi hadith. Yeah, it's really interesting, you see. Uh, Zuhri is an interesting person because, um, you know, he is in, in, some, in many ways, he's, he's a key scholar of Medina and so on, but he has these political Umayyah, Bani, like Umawi, because he worked for the Umayyads, he you know, participated in their battles and he used to be paid by them and stuff like this. On the other hand, Shia include Imam Zuhri in their biographies of the Shia. They say, some of them say Imam Zuhri was a Shia, but he was a covert Shia. Uh, a lot of the, the, radiallahu anha, a lot of the issues to do with Aisha, issues to do with the Quran, Issues to a lot of those which the Shia do pick up on. Oh, but how come you guys have got this in your books if you condemn us? They actually tend to come through Zuhri, which is an interesting thing. I do actually find it quite plausible. I think Imam Zuhri, in my understanding, was very much inclined towards the later part of his life towards the Shia um, cause. And I think he didn't come out with that openly because it would have been detrimental to his whole, um, to his career. Because in his early life, he definitely isn't. Because in the time of Imam Zaid, he doesn't seem to align himself with Imam Zaid or anything. But then I think as time progresses and you see um, uh, some of the struggles going on in Medina and stuff like this, it appears that he does seem to have aligned himself with the Shia. And this is why some of the Shia include him in their books in saying Imam Zuhri was actually a Shia. Um, so I think that's, but that's, you know, I can't, we can't say one way or the other, but this is what it seems. When you look at the riwayat that come to us, all the problematic ones that the Shia tend to use against Sunnis, they generally usually just come through Zuhri, um, which is, I think it's interesting. But I hope that uh, you helps. Okay, you want to carry on with Zuhri? It's going to stay fat. Is that on? Okay, yep, sure. Let's uh, move on to right this debate, people. David Wood versus uh, Muhammad Hijab. I don't know if you guys have watched this debate. Uh, if you haven't watched it, I uh, I think you should watch it because uh, it is, in my understanding, a monumental debate. It will definitely go down as a uh, as a key kind of debate that took place. That's my understanding, I don't know. I, I do think it's definitely worth watching. It is quite lengthy. It is, I think, just under three hours. Now, but you can watch it in parts. I did go through the whole thing. Uh, it's very entertaining to watch. Now, 
Right, David Wood. Do you guys know anything about him, by the way? Do you know anything about his father? Say that. He tried to kill his father. He tried to kill his father. Yes, yes. Did he try to kill his father? His father tried to kill him. His father tried to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this plot, this, this just plot twist after plot twist here. <laughs> so okay, sh- shall we get one version? His father tried to kill their mother. No, that that was the neighbor. <laughs> I I don't know. It could be that uh, because he he's definitely he he's he's like one of these uh, kind of evangelic kind of Christians who goes out. He he does a lot of preaching, but a lot of his da'wah, if we can use the term da'wah, is quite Islamophobic and it is very anti-Islam. So he does kind of take the mick out of Islam quite a bit. I haven't actually watched too many of his things, to be honest with you. I think I've just maybe just a few clips. That's all I've seen. Um, but he he has had many debates with people like uh, Dr. Shabir Ali. He's debated other Muslims, many Muslims. They are on uh, the debates are on YouTube, and he has his kind of channel with a large number of followers. To be fair, so this debate was on Tawhid versus the Trinity. So, <laughs> what are my thoughts on it? Uh, the debate, I do, th- I think, th- those of you that haven't watched it, it's very clear that Muhammad Hijab won that debate, hands down. And there's no uh, two ways about that. Um, and, and I'd like to go through some of that points, but then I want to discuss my thoughts on some of the, the kind of what was being debated as well. So... The topic that they chose, uh, Tawheed versus the Trinity, to be fair, one of them is reason-based. That is Tawheed, the oneness of God, is, is quite, it's very much, not quite, it is very much in line with reason. The Trinity by default is what the Christians call, and uh, what they call, irrational truths or illogical truths, truths that don't make sense so from the offset whenever you're debating something that where one side appeals to reason and the other doesn't the reason side will always make sense and prevail generally speaking as a rule of thumb because that is what appeals to people the voice of reason um now so so i could say in some ways one could argue that you know muhammad hijab would have had the upper hand from the word go because the debate was uh, already kind of destined to win almost because the topic gives you the upper hand you could argue that but to be fair I actually was I was very impressed with uh, Muhammad Hijab's research you know to 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 be very clear on that he's obvious he must have spent an incredible amount of time researching the biblical sources uh, researching and just developing a knowledge of the Bible I was much impressed i must say i didn't expect that um really him to be coming out quoting the bible time after time and on many occasions impromptu like in the q a i mean one could say well okay for the dedicated speech maybe these things are rehearsed but for the spontaneous q a to be you know quoting verses of the bible with references on all on each account is something very impressive it demonstrates an in-depth knowledge of the Bible, um, the way other scholars, the background of the Trinity. I think that was very well researched by Muhammad Hijab. So it wasn't just the voice of uh, having the voice of reason. The fact that he was very well prepared. I've got to say that um, I haven't watched much of David Wood before my what i've heard is he is usually quite well prepared this is what i've heard from pe- from people the comments and other things he didn't seem to be very well prepared for this debate so i don't know what that was those of you that have seen it he did come off a bit um i don't know like he came off a bit shaky and things like this on certain accounts and he was saying things that embarrassing himself to be fair he did say a few things which i th- which you'd think why would he if there was there was a point where he said uh, he was asked a question and he said there's a lengthy reply which uh, which I don't actually think is correct. 
and and people started laughing because that was in defense of Christianity. He, he mentioned that. So this these kind of things showed that well, hmm, he didn't really seem to be so well prepared for this. I I don't know whether he was prepared and, or not, or but he didn't appear to be. <coughs> That's one thing. The the other thing is that right. But by, by the way, I mean. I'm, ta I'm taking. Oh, I mean, I've, I've asked a few of you have watched this anyway, because I'm, I'm taking. I'm as a given that a lot of you have watched the debate. the The way it was debated, it didn't. The whole topic didn't really lean in on reason at all. Much. I mean, there were some points that Muhammad Hijab did say, given the fact that the whole thing could have been won by reason alone, really, because one makes sense and three is one doesn't make sense. That said, apart from a few points, Muhammad Hijab doesn't generally lean in on reason much. He, his point was that, look, this creed was formulated by the Nicene Council in whatever 325 or whenever they were. Uh, and can you give me any Christian sources that believed in the Trinity? Yeah, and he highlights some points, some factors that are necessary he says that, that, that they coexist, the Trinity are co-equal, coexisting and independent kind of Godheads, uh, sorry, independent persons of this Godhead. So he says that is the creed of the Trinity and I want you to show me that for 300 years any Christian that believed it in that manner. He says that people did believe in it but they believed in it differently like maybe there was a hierarchy or there were other kind of beliefs and some didn't believe in the Trinity and but show me this creed from your books prior to the Council of Nicaea. That was the main thing. And I think that was, uh, that was very well done, very well researched by Muhammad Hijab and credit where credit is due. Even though on a lot of points, to be fair, outside of this debate, I, I, I disagree on several topics with Muhammad Hijab, but I think the way he handled this from a knowledge perspective, that's what I'm speaking about right now. The way he handled uh, this debate with the points being very clear on the factors that can you show this the council of nicaea kind of constructed this can you show a similar creed from the early uh, any of the early sources was precise it was to the point and uh dr wood just fails to answer that he does try to answer it in his own way uh, he tries to say things like look well we don't need to say that because we believe uh, they, they believed that Jesus was God and they believed that the Holy Spirit was God so why do we need to find these kind of keywords but he doesn't sufficiently answer it to be fair um, so I think that was very it was quite tactile the way it was done was good they, right there was uh, just this is leaning in on some of the the pros that the the positive things that Muhammad Hijab had really done well um, targeted, made it concise, quoted just Christian sources all the way. And yeah, so I think that was that was really good. Just trying to think of some points coming to right now. He did mainly in, in several of the kind of comebacks that David Wood has. Um, Muhammad Hijab does answer them. He answers many, right? But he doesn't answer them all. And this is some of the, if we can flip the coin to some of the other, like if we're going to now look at David Wood, let's just for a moment reflect on him. He doesn't generally carry himself off well in that whole uh, debate. That said, he does pose some good questions. A lot of his questions, those of you that haven't watched it, he seems to get stuck up on some linguistic questions, which I think were, which was just dumb, if you're asking me, because it was stupid, because he repeatedly kind of hinged on this question of, uh, you know, wa ala nabi, that Allah, he does salah. He keeps saying Allah does salah, so who is he doing salah to? And to be fair, Muhammad Hijab kind of answers that very well and says that, look, this doesn't mean um, he's praying to. It means he's kind of uh, sending blessings upon. 
I think that's how he, I, I'm not sure if Muhammad Hijab did translate it like that, but that's how perhaps he, sh maybe that's a, I think is a good way to just translate it, the sending blessings upon. Now, th this goes back and that Dr. Wood doesn't seem to leave this point alone. He says, no, you know, you salli, is salah, and he brings it up time and time again. So I think that was just, um, I think it was quite dumb and pathetic on, on the part of Dr. Wood really to, to do that because, you know, if, if somebody's answered the question, you don't understand the Arabic language, just take it for now and, and maybe you can research it further. So that said, I think Dr. Wood did present some, some good kind of, um, when I say good, I mean some tough questions. But I think, luckily enough, he articulated them so pathetically that it didn't actually, he, ne <laughs> he never managed to score a single punch with them. I think that the gist of what he was trying to get at, he had some very good questions and arguments that were kind of tough. But because he was, I don't know, apparently he's been doing this for decades, so I don't know why he was so poor at kind of, articulating it but he had certain questions that if I get if I've understood them correctly what he was trying to say was that you're mocking the Trinity or you're ridiculing the Trinity because it's incoherent it's incomprehensible this is the gist of I think what he was trying to say he was trying to say this is what I understood at a deeper level I, I could be I mean, either I'm giving him too much intelligence here, or, but I think this is what he was actually trying to say, is that you yourself in Islam have many incomprehensible truths that you seem to be okay with. So why are you struggling with this? Mashallah. That's Dr. Wood calling in <laughs> to say, yep, that's what I meant. <laughs> so... What he was trying to say, I think, was that, look, if this is an appeal to reason, if you're appealing to reason that three equals one is counter reason, irrational and makes no sense, then your debate on the Quran being uncreated is counter reason. Your debate on there being sifat of Allah that exist alongside him and are not him is unreasonable and counter reason. Your debate like this, he was, there were several things that he points out to, but he articulates them so dumbly, like in such a dumb way that luckily enough, I don't think most people got what he was saying and therefore the whole argument just got pushed by the wayside. But these genuinely were some tough questions that he presented in saying things like, oh, you're saying, um, for example, he did say one which Muhammad Hijab does respond to about the, the shafa'a intercession and he well, how can the Quran intercede for you because if the Quran is God then how can God intercede before God that was his to which Muhammad Hijab says well that's the actions as in your recitation of the Quran is as an action and the reward is interceding so I think th that one he kind of answers but so there, there, was the, the, there were these points. I do think the difficult one of the uncreatedness of the Qur'an, Muhammad Hijab didn't answer. Um, but generally, because they were presented so weakly, uh, Muhammad Hijab does manage to just kind of destroy him very easily because he's not presenting them very... Um, they, they're not so solid. Whereas if he was, if because if that's what he was trying, because that's what I understood from him, that he was trying to say that, look, the Trinity is counter reason, but you guys yourselves accept so many things that are counter reason. Hmm, which would lead back to a point that I do stress on so many occasions, that it is so important, I feel, especially in this day and age, that Muslims, we do believe in the Quran to be in line with the voice of reason otherwise these arguments don't actually stand you see because 
if somebody had articulated that a bit better, it would have been very difficult to answer to. Because if you yourself are accepting, you'd asked about miracles. If you yourself are accepting uh, miracles which make no sense, then the question would be that, well, three equaling one, three equating to one doesn't make sense either. But who cares? Since we're in, you know, since the making sense card has kind of gone out the window, who cares anyway? Uh, I So uh, it's an... You know, an all or nothing. Either everything must make sense, or fine, it's just arbitrary. You know, 10% doesn't make sense and 90% does, or 20% doesn't and 80% does. It's arbitrary. So I think these are some things worth thinking about. He does present, um, Dr. Wood says things about like uh, anthropomorphic kind of beliefs that some Muslims have had, like they believed God was uh, like he had body parts and stuff like this and and to be fair there have been muslims that have believed like that um but i understand that in the debate you see the whole purpose of a debate is to uh to kind of win there's no two ways about it you know this all this 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 whole thing that you know like imam shafi uh, allegedly once said, I debate somebody and I make dua that may the truth be manifest on his tongue. You know, may may he win. <laughs> uh, well, either I'm not sure if Imam Shafi really said that or if he did, maybe in his day and age. <laughs> Nowadays, it's all drama. Tater. <laughs> it's all tater, right? This, It's all about winning. So I understand that uh, Muhammad Hijab, you know, would... And it's, you know, he would do what, fair enough, because the main point is to win. And, you know, so he did dismiss a lot of these things and saying that there is no such thing. Muslims have never said stuff like this. But Muslims have said it, unfortunately, not that we agree with them. I don't agree with those Muslims that say things like that, that God has, you know, these kind of body parts or these kind of things. And uh, But there have been, unfortunately, Muslims that have said things like that. So... There was a bit of kind of, um, there were some occasions where he was saying things, Dr. Wood was uh, putting objections and saying some Muslims have said this, this, this. And he, Muhammad Hijab did kind of just say, no, that's not true at all. Whereas in a few of those occasions, it was actually true that, but it may not be true of all people. The other thing is that Muslim creed, you see, uh, our aqidah as well, like if you're going to take the Nicene aqidah, our aqidah too, if we're going to use formal creed, you see, this is why I'm kind of never really in favor of these kind of aqidah things. I always make a distinction between aqidah and iman, that creed and faith, that the Prophet came to, uh, to teach faith, not to teach creed, because with creed, it's always institutionalized and even the Muslim creed is like what at least 300 years old after the Prophet It's not like you know at least two to three hundred years after the Prophet It's not like something that was emerged at the time of the Prophet in fact Surprisingly the Prophet taught very little things on how what Muslims must believe about God Except the very basic like God is one and things like that, but he didn't you know what today Muslims teach us creed Oh, you must believe this and God has these attributes and these attributes are like this. That is actually very, uh, I think, irrational, nonsensical, not based in the Quran and Sunnah. And it actually does lead to a contradiction because many Muslims today do push this creed that Allah has sifat. He has attributes. The attributes are not him and they're not other than him. So what on earth is that then? You know, la uh, laysat, what is it? La huwa wa la ghayru. That's the term they use in a lot of the, the uh, creed books that they are not God and they are not other than God. This is why Ibn Rushd, the Muslim philosopher, said, You guys must be drunk on something. <laughs> like, what on earth does this stuff even mean that you're pushing? So, Muslims do. We, but the, the plus side is that, and I think Dr. Wood highlighted this, but it served as a strength that despite the efforts of uh, Muslim clergy to push this stuff the common Muslims don't know about this stuff so despite the fact that the clergy have tried hard in getting everybody institutionalized into creed but alhamdulillah the common Muslim doesn't really know this stuff and have probably never even heard of it so when 
Dr. Wood or these kind of people are saying these things, it doesn't resonate with people. So because they, so they're thinking, what on earth is he on about? So once again, it's easy to just dismiss. And, you know, it was quite easy in, in or not easy, but it was then Muhammad Hijab would then just destroy his points because a lot of people wouldn't understand them anyway. So that is, um, but there were some genuine kind of like tough challenges he did present. I think like the, uh, that, you guys yourself need to then either be consistent in appealing to reason all the way or you don't. And so I think that's uh, overall coming, m moving on to the way they conducted it. I do think that um, it's undebatable. I mean, it's actually very clear. Muhammad Hijab himself says that, look, I'm during this debate, I'm not going to show any respect to um, Dr. David Wood or whatever, David Wood. That's an interesting, um, you see, I, I, don't, I don't know, I was in a bit of a dilemma about this. Because on one hand, I could see that, because he justifies it, uh, Muhammad Hijab does, and he says, look, this guy's just been a, <laughs> better watch my language now, he's just been, uh, <laughs> he's, just, he's just been an idiot, and he's been a bigot towards Muslims, he's, he's an Islamophobe, he... He has caused a lot of hatred against Muslims. He's caused attacks on Muslims. I, I mean, I, I don't know, but presumably that's true. And be, if that be true, you can understand on one hand where Muhammad Hijab was coming from in the sense that he's thinking, well, you know, you've kind of done us over for so long. I'm going to have a zero tolerance attitude to you. But... Uh, and so hence he has a very, so Muhammad Hijab is very kind of aggressive. He has an aggressive, I mean, not aggressive as in like, uh, but it is, the demeanor is aggressive. I mean, you can't de deny that it is aggressive. Like it's a lot of answer me, tell me, you know, show me this today. You won't be able, you know, like it's a very kind of uh, condescending uh, and loud. It is very loud. I mean, I'm sure... Part of that may be because Muhammad Hijab is obviously used to generally with his debates like he does, like in Speaker's Corner, in Hyde Park, whatever they do, probably shout and stuff like that. But that may be part of it. It may be part of the fact that he, like he said, look, I ain't going to show you respect because you've always been putting us down. So, you know, to hell with you. Um, but da David Wood is kind of very reasonable from his behavior all the way through. He doesn't kind of get rude, generally speaking. He does one, two little kind of uh, sneers and digs uh, in between where he kind of tries to crack a few jokes about Islam. But generally, he's kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't get equally aggressive. Like, he doesn't kind of say, well, you know, whatever. This. I don't know if he usually does. Once again, I haven't watched too many of his things, but in that debate. So the question was, that was the justification of Muhammad Hijab. On the other hand, it did make... Muslims look kind of like the usual, you know, like the, you know, you get that meme with the, uh, you know, there's that guy who says 19, 20, and the guy's like, and then you've got like, and then it moves on, and then it says like 1955, and then working on a TV, and on this side, you've got the, the Mulvi kind of guy going, uh, and then it says like 2018, and now they've got all this technology, and the Mulvi is still like, uh. <laughs> you must have seen that meme, it's quite funny, but. Um, it did, on the other hand, it did show that, it did prove that, see, like Muslims, oh, like they're very, see, they're just aggressive, they're just disrespectful, they kind of shout, they, they, they like to kind of stamp the authority, they, it did give that, but I don't, you see, I'm, when I watched it, I watched the whole thing and I thought about it, and I was in a bit of a dilemma because I was thinking, well, I think Muhammad Hijab on that one was in a situation damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because I think the fact that he did, he did it to teach him a lesson. Because unquestionably, he destroys and uh, David Wood. And with that attitude, it, it just amplifies it. Because you're constantly kind of shouting down and saying, well, go on then, answer this, answer this, don't you dare. You know, like, sh you know, like, shut up, don't bring, I I'm not sure if he says shut up, but he said, don't bring me, you know, ask me, don't tell me, blah, blah, you know, constantly. Now that magnifies your impact. 
So on one hand, you're really, he's put in his place. And undoubtedly he was. <laughs> so I'm, I can imagine he must have felt like terrible. That might have added to why he was kind of shaky. So I could see that on the other hand, you see, that's in a lot of the comments online, on a lot of the things on YouTube when I saw it, uh, all, most, almost all of the non-Muslims use that point to kind of then detract from the win. To say, well, you know, typical, you know, shouting Muslims, you know, just nothing better to do, just stamp the authority, you know, be disrespectful, be rude. Why not kind of show it back? You know, if he's being rude, why not kind of turn the other cheek and kill him with kindness, so to speak? Now I say, oh, kind. <laughs> well, Dr. Wood. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you see, it's, it's a tricky one because I watched it and I have to say, on some parts, he is very kind of like, and then I suppose he's, obviously, he's, he's, he's a very big person as well. I mean, so he must be almost about seven foot or something, right? So you can imagine, obviously, in his presence, so he's just sitting not so far away from him, and then he's shouting, and he must have that impact. So I can see that this, on the other hand, I can see him saying that, look, you've been taking the mick out of Muslims for so long, today I'm going to teach you a lesson that I'm going to, you know, put the nails on the coffin that next time you sit in front of a Muslim. So I don't know how he should have behaved on that, but I do think that from the overall view, um, it, it was used as ammunition clearly. So I could see that point, but because it went all the way through, it made Muslims, it did give that thing. And then the other thing was in the crowd, Muslims, you know, they started the whole takbir, you know, Allahu Akbar. And then luckily nobody went. <laughs> They're like, no, this is the Muslim side. <laughs> oh, it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> but uh, I think that that didn't help really because it showed this whole thing of like kind of just, you know, Muslims kind of being rowdy and stuff like that. So that was some of my <coughs> thoughts about the akhlaq characteristics. But I definitely do feel that this is in many ways a monumental kind of discussion. I do think if you haven't watched it, some when you get time, do watch it. It will definitely go down. I think that David Wood will forever be embarrassed now. What was funny was in the YouTube comments, I read the YouTube comments, uh, so many of them, not the whole thing, there's so many. Uh, but what was shocking is that the the kind of supporters of David Wood were still trying to act like that he'd won. <laughs> they were like, oh, I mean, some of them were just saying about, oh, you know, he should, that uh, hijab should have behaved better and stuff like this. But many of them were like, oh, excellent. You know, you did amazing. You did this, you did this. And then like so many comments down, you'll get one comment saying, uh, why are all the supporters acting like he won? <laughs> so I think that was, uh, it was funny to read. But, uh, but yeah, but uh, overall, so if, uh, if any of the people watching this as well, uh, including Muhammad Hijab and others, I think that it was definitely, there was an excellent performance of knowledge. That, that I have to say, from the biblical side of things. So, and that is, it's uh, something really inspiring and also a lesson that, you know, if you are going to debate something or discuss it, you should have thorough knowledge. I don't know whether, uh, I read somewhere Muhammad Hijab even studied Hebrew for it. I don't, if that be the case, wow, I'm, I'm impressed. But, uh, so th that is something that was well done. His own day and age, Ahmadi, that was the whole, oh, you know, that shouting and the whole, day, it, it kind of pushed us straight back into, into that era. So I think we do need to up our akhlaq game, uh, definitely. And I think also one thing I would say is that we need to kind of, what we can learn from this debate is if we're going to be objective and true to ourselves, is that have, what we can't do is have irrational beliefs ourselves and then condemn other people for irrational beliefs. Like we must be consistent. That's one thing that I uh, would like to definitely uh, take away from that uh, and I would encourage people to take that away that we need to revisit some understandings we have because if we're saying things like look you know this was done and laws of nature don't matter and this don't matter and uh, none of these things matter then 
3 equals 1 doesn't matter because what's to say that God can't make himself be three manifestations apart from reason? And if you throw reason out the window, then nothing matters. It's like, what's to say? Well, you could say, well, three doesn't equal one according to mathematics. You say, yeah, but, but maybe God made an exception using his all power, all powerful power. So the, it becomes an absurd argument. I accept that, but it's absurd because you're not sticking to the voice of reason. So if we're going to stick to the voice of reason, we have to follow through in Islam. There's no point having it at that level. And then we start saying things like, you know, like somebody had sent me this, these clips of let's drink camel urine or let's do this or, you know, or, or miracles happen in certain ways. And, you know, there is no laws of nature or when God doesn't want them and stuff like this. That to me is a confusing message. So that's all I would like to say on that debate, inshallah. So I hope that, uh, but well done, um, definitely for, for having the debate, I think. Muhammad Hijab, I think that was well done. I have heard on other debates, meanwhile, I hear that Sheikh Asrar has been challenged. <laughs> that, di that challenge, by the way, is not how to challenge. <laughs> have you guys seen the clip? Have you guys seen the clip? This God, what is happening to the Muslim communities, man? This, 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 uh, I don't want to, but there's, I think it's called Al Islam. Al Islam or Islam? Al Islam. Al Islam. Al Islam Productions. Al Islam Productions. Al Islam Productions. Is it called Al Islam Productions? Right, so, uh, anyway, so these guys who normally debate the Shia are now presenting their challenge to Sheikh Asrar. But I mean, God, you know, one thing I gotta say, watch it. I mean, the, speaking about the other debate, it was presentable. It was, I mean, this standard is just pure, just, <laughs> and growing a big beard. Like, what is, nobody here's got that yet. <laughs> why have we become so, <laughs> why have we become so embarrassing? She massive kind of overgrown beard. And then they'll just shave this and it'll make the lip protrude. It'll be like, like kind of like this. And you think, well, uh. <laughs> oh, yeah, so Imam Malik saying that, Imam Malik had some insight. After all, he wasn't just Imam Malik for no reason. <laughs> when he said that, you know, that Shaitan couldn't have done a better job, a better, a better makeover. But yeah, so anyway, that's on fashion tips. <laughs> and the, seriously, I don't know. Is us as Muslim, the Muslim community, we need to up our game. <laughs> but yeah, so these debate, this this kind of debate challenge, of saying I call you out to debate the the these blasphemies and this, it's just so. I just find it so. I mean, one, it is useless, but it's so out of. It doesn't even fit in, and most people don't even know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> it's like most people would have no idea now. In the, like, what is, you know, Ahmad Raza Khan Rilvi, or what was Ashraf Ali Tanwi, or what was most... I mean, one is if you just said it as a passing comment in a discussion, or you may, you know, somebody asked you and you responded, but bringing these debates to life in 2018, in the UK, where, you know, like... But people have got no idea. I just read today on a link that somebody said, uh, they shared a link about what was Zayn Malik. Zayn Malik, yeah. yeah. The, whatever, the star, the, the singer, yeah? Yeah. So he's, he's left Islam. Yeah, so he says he's, he's left Islam. And then there were some of the comments, and so I clicked on the link and I read some of the comments. And some people were like, ah, you know, there you go, see, you can't stay away from music being haram, and then that leads you to kufa. <laughs> now you're a kafir, ha. <laughs> I thought, oh, great, that logic worked well, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, there you go. So just <laughs> followed the pipe, pipe, pipe into. <laughs> but the. And then some people said, oh, this was a natural conclusion, and some people said, but. At a greater level, people, this is the tragedy of what we're living in. It's not about Zayn Malik or whoever, but it's about people can't relate to the religion. It doesn't make sense to them.
Like they think like, what well, you know, it's I, I read his interview that the link sent and he said, look, I believe in a kind of supreme being, a supreme God, but I just don't believe in Islam. It doesn't make sense to me. And it seems to be restricted to, you know, it just becomes a nightmare for philosophers and stuff like this. And in many ways, you can see that thought resonating from a lot of young people because they're feeling disheartened about what's going on. So I think, I mean, if, you know, if people do want to have a dialogue or a debate on certain things, fair enough. I mean, but I would say at least let there be some relevance to the discussion. You know, some, not just debating, you know, like a figure, like the whole purpose of an entire debate is, let's say, uh, Ahmad Raza Khan Brilvi. That is the whole purpose. Somebody who's, you know, passed away over a century ago. It doesn't really make a difference. There isn't really... Uh, so I just feel that that's, mm, that's my thoughts anyway on debates, but cool. Let's take some Q&A people, let's take some... He's left some backward BS he thought was Islam, I'm sure he's better off now. Oof. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and I thought I was unrestricted. <laughs> no, I mean, look, shall I tell you something though? There are many people who have issues with certain aspects of Islam. Because of the way it's being, certain aspects that are being, that are being shoved down their throats. In which, truly speaking, there is a huge array of diversity, a huge uh, uh, array of opinions. There is much diversity. So, for example, music. Music is not, in fact, it's not haram, obviously. I've got a whole video on that. You can watch that, but... The point, it's a musical. <laughs> uh, the irony. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I won't have music in there, stuff for Allah. <laughs> no. So there's a... Uh, I've got a... Uh, but m my point is that saying this to people who are singers, I can just imagine the kind of hate he would have been getting anyway from Muslims, to be honest with you. You know, the... Oh, you, you might as well be a kafir. You might as well, it's a haram. You know, you're going against Allah. You're going against... <coughs> I mean, I've never heard his songs. So I don't really know if they're any good. But presumably, like the whole point of this thing of saying, look, or anything... I don't know whether he drank alcohol or not, but people are saying, oh, you know, he maybe drank alcohol and this, this. But my point is playing the Taliban with people, trying to go around and, you know, like, oh, I'm going to beat the Sharia into you, just makes people hate Islam. So there should be a message of compassion, of love. And I do feel that many people who leave Islam, leave it on reasons which actually Islam catered for. I've had, I've had several, several ex-Muslims or people that were agnostic or that had left Islam saying that, oh, you know, that they find themselves at peace with the faith now. That why, after learning about this kind of diversity, I've had other people say to me that now that they're too far gone, but had of they had access to these this understanding before, they would never have left Islam to begin with. That they never knew that, you know, that, that I've had people say to me they struggled with, with basic things like demonic possessions and magic and all this kind of stuff and didn't make sense to them. And people saying, no, if you deny that, then you're, you're Kafir, you can burn in hell, and blah, blah, blah. And so I just, it's a shame, really. And I think that this, we are a unique community, and I use unique in, in a unique way when I say that. We are a unique community. We are the only people, perhaps, on earth who feel that we have a right on somebody to tell them off, regardless of our distance. So, for example... You could be sitting here, a British, let's say Muslim, let's say Pakistani, born and raised in the UK of Indo-Pak kind of origins, that kind of culture. There could be a Muslim in Brazil, South America, who's doing something, let's say he's doing something online. Now you read a post. Now, we are the only community who would feel that, oh, I've got the right to tell him off. Because we share a faith. Say, uh, why are you acting like a kafir? <laughs> <laughs> you know, people, people will be like, whoa, excuse me, do, do I know you? Do you know me? I mean, what gives you this right to just tell me off? But we are perhaps unique 
in doing that. I don't think I don't think generally other communities behave like that. Maybe amongst their own cultural things, but with people that they've got nothing to do with. So these kind of things, and we can become. You know, recently there was this whole thing on uh, Dina Tokyo, Dina Tokyo. This whole thing on since we, huh? did, did you just raise your hand? Uh, no, I <laughs> you know her. Been watching her. Oh, he's been watching her. He's <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, it's in that, in that. <laughs> Well, if Dina does watch this, well, for your information, Ibi is watching your hijab tutorials. <laughs> and he's benefited much. <laughs> right, by taking it off. <laughs> right, now that's a joke. Right, so my whole point was uh, so this, so she, she, from what I know, is a very popular YouTube hijabi model, I think. Or I don't know if she's a model, but a vlogger, vlogger, yeah. So now the whole point is a lot of people, she's taken the hijab off in recent times. I think, has it just been a few months or something? Who's, who's keeping that? Huh? Few days. Few days. Few days. It's been a few days. You're an avid follower. <laughs> when she takes it off, is she usually in the kitchen area? <laughs> <laughs> What well, she's saying, more importantly, where are you, brother? <laughs> she, she's saying that she wants to wear it when she feels like it. Okay, so, <laughs> oh, well. brother, has precise, <laughs> at precisely 18.07, <laughs> she took it off. <laughs> right, so, is it, so I thought, okay, but anyway, whether it's weeks or months or whatever, she's recently taken off the hijab, <coughs> or she's kind of downgraded from the hijab, saying, look, I, you know, I don't feel it's so much of a big deal. I'll wear it sometimes, won't wear it sometimes. And I know there's been a huge uproar, and I've read some of the things on newsfeed, and people really kind of, boy, has she? I, I wouldn't be surprised if she perhaps leaves Islam at some point, because the amount of hate that she has got from people. Now, I can, I'm just trying to, to get into the minds of people. I can understand from one perspective that because she rose on the back of hijab, like she rose to fame, her claim to fame was as a hijabi, not just as a Muslim opinionist. Like not just, you know, I'm, I'm a Muslim who has an opinion, I like to talk on matters. So, you know, come listen to me, I'm going to talk on <clears throat> politics or, you know, whatever, international affairs, or I'm going to talk on money, or I'm going to talk about anything. She, my understanding is, rose on her sole kind of foundation was the hijab. By doing so, she kind of accrued a huge following. I, I, I believe, I don't know what, what her following, but I, I believe it's massive, or was massive anyway. Um, to which she kind of accessed huge amount of opportunities as well. I'm sure in terms of revenue, in terms of money, and obviously even YouTube, I'm sure she must make a hell of a lot of money through stuff like YouTube for stuff like that. Now, after several years, I don't know how many years, but whatever, I think it's about seven years or something, is it, or whatever. But after so many years, she has kind of said, well, I don't think the hijab is that important, I'm taking it off. In and of itself, that opinion, I think, fine. I mean, I think that's an opinion amongst opinions, whatever, and we can discuss that. But I think because her claim to fame was about hijab, obviously all these hijabis and all her followers, who mainly were hijabis and the brother here, <laughs> <laughs> and Ibi, of course. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's Ibi? Who's on there? As Ibi X O X. <laughs> Just to kind of feminise the <laughs> and and one of those cute emojis at the end. <laughs> so the thing is now, her followers feel betrayed. So they feel that she. How can she do this? Because she has through this whole thing. Okay, fair enough. She's given us inspiration. She's given us courage, but she, on the back of hijab, rose to this strength or power. And now she's kind of like abandoned hijab once she's got there. So now that you've become a celebrity, well, now you can just talk on opinions. But So I, I can kind of understand why some people feel the way they do. Um, so that's... But then to kind of like, um, from my understanding, she's been proper, hunted, and they've been... You know, you this, 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 you burn in hell, and 
blah 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 and kafir and murtad and all these kind of things and this is once again the the, the kind of venom that we find amongst unfortunately religious people and so it becomes a very kind of like a dark cult so I think that kind of behavior is unacceptable I think those Muslim women that do that's very you know that's that much kudos and respect to them for that but those who don't and if they change their opinion I suppose that is generally speaking it's just life and not whether your own understanding throughout life will develop you may today feel something is right and maybe later on you may feel at some point you know what I did argue for it back then but now I kind of feel that it's not the main thing was something else like I just be nailed for this argument so this person I knew said you know he would 48 miles a woman could not go more than 48 miles unaccompanied and he would impose that on his wife as in his wife obviously was of that opinion as well then because she and I believe personally she was just brainwashed into it but nevertheless this opinion so what would happen is he would have to pick his wife up from from I can't remember which city it was let's say it was to Birmingham but he would go halfway and she would go halfway and then he would pick her up from there because she wasn't allowed to drive the whole way home uh, and 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 they were they were very educated people so I was wow but then what was more interesting was during our getting to know each other and chatting and learning he had changed his opinion and said well you know now I've, I've come to realize that that doesn't actually make any sense. It doesn't need to be 48 miles. That said, but I fought for it for so long and hard. I'm just going to go with it because now to go against the fight would look embarrassing. I think that's wrong and we should be reminded by Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu who said that when he got into an argument, which he, uh, well, sorry, not an argument, but in a disputed matter, which he had for long stood by, he said, that look, It is better that we turn back to the truth rather than achacha. Sorry, that was the interim Bollywood music by. Uh, <laughs> next time, suspenseful music. <laughs> that one didn't quite cut it. <laughs> so, rather than we should turn back to the haq rather than continue with falsehood, no matter how long we've been with it. But that's my thoughts. Right, any. What should we? Let's take some questions. I had a question and about uh, literal verses of the Quran and metaphorical verses. Of right. Uh, There's a couple of issues I wanted to ask. Literal uh, verses. Uh, people like Sheikh Osama Hassan says, when it comes to evolution and the fall of Adam and Islam, we shouldn't uh, accept it literally because it doesn't make sense in our mm -hmm. modern age. And likewise, things like non-believers going to hell for eternity, you know, burning in hell for infinity, for finite actions. He's saying, you know, it's metaphorical. Uh, what's 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 your name, sorry? It's Maj. Maj, Maj. Okay, yeah. carry on. Yeah. Um, so, who do we believe? I mean, it wasn't expanded on. I don't think in that in that hadith. So, who should we believe when it comes to verses? For one scholar says they're literal. For example, Adam and Eve, you know, being in, in paradise and then coming to earth. Um, or should we believe people like Sheikh Sam Hassan who says the fall of Adam and Eve took place on earth? I mean, th these kind of things are just, the question is about, yeah, right, the question is about evolution and things like this that today certain scholars are calling for us to revisit our understanding of the Quran. Um, is this a problem? Um, some people have said in the past that Adam was in heaven and other people said that heaven was on earth. Is that a problem? So one of the things I wanted to say is, go on. Then. Um, I've been looking at arguments for ex-Muslims, and this is one of the issues they touch upon. Evolution. Uh, evolution and also infinite punishment. Infinite punishment. For a lifetime which is 60, 70 years, maybe 80 or 90 years long. Lifetime of sin. Yeah, so they say, you know, <laughs> if people like us who are not all merciful wouldn't punish a person for eternity. Of course. Uh, why would Allah just keep on... So the, yeah, the key question on, on the punishment of the afterlife doesn't match the crime perpetrated in this it dunya. The, it's uh, not it's commensurate. Yeah, it's commensurate. Yeah. Oh, rather. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, so, hmm, so what is, uh, what, so what game is God playing, huh? 
<laughs> is that the, the question? Yes. So, so the, have you have you heard my responses to these before, by the way? I, I think, I can't remember. I probably Mashallah, Mashallah. But if it's Dina Tokyo, you've definitely been. <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> maybe I should wear a hijab and then take it off. <laughs> I'll have to send my research to her to make a video on it. Then you would have watched it. <laughs> so the the right. So I've answered all of these in detail before. Uh, evolution, all of this kind of stuff. I have shown that look, there is a difference of opinion in Islamic understanding. When we read the Quran, the Quran actually. In fact, what I would advise you to do, because I won't do it justice today. Uh, I would advise you, when you get a moment, watch my video, which is a reply to Sheikh Yasser al-Qadi. So Sheikh Yasser al-Qadi, when he made that khutbah, which, I'm pretty, uh, which a huge bulk of was just aimed at me, um, in that he, some of the challenges or the questions he presents is evolution. And he says, well, these Muslims today, some of them that say evolution is compatible with Islam and blah, blah, blah. It's you know, basically saying that this is nonsense. So in my response, I go through the Quranic verses that are in line with evolution. And how do you answer? Like, so to, to deny evolution, you have to be radically interpreting so many verses of the Quran. Like verses like, you know, that he created you in stages. He grew you like plants out of the earth. Uh, you'd have to be, there's so many verses, I go through the entire thing, saying that, look, how would you, when Allah says, that we, from a single source of life, created everything that was alive today. That's a clear verse of the Quran. So these verses clearly argue in line for things like evolution. Now, one could say, well, there's other verses in the Quran, things like, um, um, you know, Allah saying, I created Adam um, from, you know, with my two hands and things like this. How do you understand those verses? Well, if you would, you're going to have to end up interpreting one of these. And in all honesty, those verses to do with Allah saying things like that are usually not understood by people literally. Most Muslims don't understand things like Allah saying, oh, look, I've got two hands and I'm creating Adam. They just understand that to mean affection and care and things like this, that God is saying that he was very affectionate, that Adam is like there was that Adam was special, that this is the, the thing. And and then I in my video, I highlight the some very fascinating verses, which are actually quite uh, which pose problems to people that are very anti-evolution uh, when it comes to Adam because Allah says uh, that we created insan from a solala from a, a kind of a gooey extract of thin of kind of like clay or whatever uh, but then it says that ثم جعلناه في قار uh, no, before that it says Nutfatan fi qararim makin. Right. Then we made him doing it, by the way, doing it all the way from Coventry, bringing his hift of the Quran with him. <laughs> right. Then we placed him as a drop of uh, of semen in a firm uh, kind of environment, a uh, firm settling, which is the womb. Now, the question is all the mufassirin, that's like following on from a verse. All the Mufassirin say the first thing, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ is Adam. But then was Adam a drop of sperm? And then they say, because it says, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاهُ Then we made him. So here they've had to re... They've had to force, superimpose an interpretation saying, no, this doesn't mean Adam. This part here is now talking about other people. Okay, fine, but that's an interpretation. Then you have other verses, by the way, like things, and I go through all of these in detail, like when Allah says, we created uh, ma, uh, what, we created man and woman, and from them many... Uh, by the way, all of these verses that say that, that we created mankind from a single soul, 
you know this this thing من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها and created from it its partner. It comes in about five or six different verses in the Quran. It never mentions Adam in them. Although the word Adam is used for Adam on several occasions in the Quran, it's it's used often. I mean, I think it's up to 25 times or something. But it, the word Adam, Allah does, you know, uses Adam's name on many occasions. But whenever this verse comes that we created mankind from a single soul, never says we created mankind from Adam. Never, not in a single verse of the Quran. Um, but he says, min nafsin wahida. Um, and then what's interesting in one of these, Allah says that, oh, and from it he created its partner. And when he covered, uh, as in intimacy, when they had sexual intercourse, she was of child. And Allah says, and then as the pregnancy grew, uh, they made dua. In, uh, in salihan, that If you give us a sound child, we will be very grateful. They made dua. Then Allah says, when we gave them a sound child, them too, they did shirk with Allah. Was that Adam? This is a new story. We've never heard that story about Adam. And then people say that was Adam. Because they have to, because this is where mankind began. So, so they kind of, then they say, oh, like if you read Ibn Jarir Tabari and all these other Mufassirin, they're going to say, well, hmm. Maybe this was a lesser kind of shirk he did, like Shaitan said to him, look, they say shirk fil asma, like he decided to name the sun after some kind of false god or, or some person, but he, it's not that he really believed. But it's nonsense, like why are you degrading prophets like that? So I feel that these, we can revisit, these beliefs do need to be revisited. I don't feel it clashes with the Quran. Um, and I don't think it's it should be used to freak people out of Islam because today the problem is Islam has never clashed with science up until today we are in a, a very kind of like history in the making Islam has never clashed with science in our history up until today where through genetic DNA we can see that evolution existed not just through fossils. Fossils is the weaker uh, evidence. So today through DNA. And Islam, the, sorry, the interpretation of Islam by many people is no. So for the first time in Islamic history, Islam is clashing with science. That has never happened. So, yeah, so I, I, if that answers the... the yeah, Sheikh. Uh, so there was just the issue about infinite punishment as well. About what, the, sorry? Infinite punishment in Jahannam. Infinite. And one of the things, sorry to take up your time, but... Um, oh, don't worry about it. We're just sitting here for yeah, you. Don't one of the things... <laughs> <laughs> one of the things Our time is useless. It's not like we have so many YouTube followers <laughs> that we make money. <laughs> one final thing is, um, my understanding is, maybe I've interpreted it wrong, but Allah SWT says He created the earth, then He moved on to the heavens. But then cosmologists will say, but the heavens were formed first and the earth came four billion years later. And they caught God out. So, <laughs> so, so I'm not surprised. God said, well, how do I know cosmologists yeah. were going to come? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't created them at that point. <laughs> so, you know, people who object to Islam, they say, make, they say it doesn't make sense. Or then obviously you need people like yourself to interpret these things. No, look, Allah says, for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that um, the verse, are you referring to the verse Thumma stawaila sama wa hiya Yeah. That absolutely. he created the heavens and the earth, then he turned to the sky whilst it was still a kind of smoke, yeah. smoky, kind of gaseous liquid or whatever formation. And, and then said, things, sorry, uh, so, sorry, I'm really sorry about this. Oh no, um, it's okay. About the verse. It's, okay. <laughs> yeah. it's been there for oh, quite a while now. <laughs> it says that it's created in uh, several stages, the earth in several stages. So I think it says two stages for earth uh, and then four stages for the universe, or maybe, sorry, I can't remember, but if you look at the size of Earth compared to the universe, mm -hmm. you know, it's so small, you know, it can't be compared. Of course, but I don't understand what the question so is. So it's like me saying, you know, I spent two days creating this room, and then I spent... No, but that's not, that's not true, because when you look at, look, when you look at all the verses, Generally, Allah is not saying things like what you're trying to say is He's putting them on a par with each other. Yeah, it's confusing. Yeah, 
So whereas in reality, in cosmological reality, the earth is so minuscule that you can't even really see it. So why not go on about the universe and then just mention once, but like 15 times about the universe? Is this possibly? Yeah. Possibly. Right, well, first of all, you have to understand something. Allah generally, that's not how, it, there's not like a system in the sense of saying every time he mentions this, he mentions that four times. There are verses that he creates the heavens and the earth, for example, and, and like the one, then he turned to them and stuff like this and said, will you kind of come of your own will or so on. These verses are not literal, uh, but put that aside. The Quran came to address a people. Allah says, Inna anzalnaun Qur'anan Arabian la'allakum ta'qilun. I send down this Quran in this Arabic language for you in the hope that you may reason with it. Now reason, it comes in a stage, like there's a, there's a spectrum. So in 7th century Arabia, there was an understanding. Even today, there's a certain understanding. If Allah was to address us with categorical facts of the universe, nobody would believe. Nobody, like let's just be real. If Allah was to say, I've said this before, if Allah was to say that, by the way, the universe as it is, there's no such thing as color. There's no such thing as sound. There's no such thing as truly taste, like as in it doesn't have an actual objective reality to it. Uh, even sounds are just sound waves being picked up and interpreted by the brain. They don't actually have an existence. The, that the universe is actually colorless, odorless, insipid. It is, uh, who, who, who would accept these things? You'd reject the message, yet that is the truth in its brutal form. Even today we wouldn't accept that because we don't see that we see the world colorful. So if somebody said the world doesn't actually have color, like we would think, what on earth are you on about? So Allah is addressing a people in a way that they can understand, that humans understand things. What he isn't trying to do is, okay, today this surah is to teach you all cosmology. <laughs> and then the next one will be on geology and then we're going to go through the sciences yeah. and the, you know so Allah's not trying to I know let's create engineers and stuff like this he's just going to tell you look iqra seek knowledge the people of knowledge are great and people themselves will go about discover the earth they'll become naturalists scientists engineers whatever they will do this on their own accord but Allah is not trying to teach these things so he wasn't trying to teach cosmology he wasn't trying to say by the way, and he was going by what people understood. Because if he started to use other things, they would have mocked him. And they would have not believed. <clears throat> so it's like in a hadith, the Prophet said that speak to people in accordance with their reason. Do you wish that Allah and His Messenger are denied? Because you might speak about something which people just totally can't fathom. So they will just reject the whole message. They'll say this person's just chatting nonsense. You know, what is he talking about? Like, can you imagine that? Oh, there's a universe and really this earth can't even be seen. And people will be like, oh, this vast earth can't be seen. Ah, yeah, yeah. He's definitely telling the truth. <laughs> so I think that's always important to understand these things. Cool. Are they... Are, what are the questions? But does the Ard mean the planet Earth or does it mean soil? That's a good question. Ard, uh, la tierra. Okay, so the Earth can mean soil, like just as we use Earth to mean soil as well in English. So you could say, well, you know, you plant this into the Earth. I'm not talking about the whole planet in that sentence. I'm not saying, and you wouldn't understand the whole planet in that sentence. You would understand. The earth as in soil. So in Arabic as well, Ard does mean uh, the Qurat al It does mean the, the actual, the earth, the planet. And it does also refer to the kind of soil in that understanding. But soil does, there are separate words for soil as well, Torab and so on. But yeah. Cool. Oh, go on. Shamas. 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 The deviant, he's attended this gathering. <laughs> Boycott him, blacklist him. No. <laughs> Sorry, you were saying. Yeah, um, the question I had was, um, you know when Imam Ghazali says that 
if the a true image of Islam doesn't reach a person. Mm -hmm. So are those uh, uh, um, uh, uh, distorted. distorted yeah, image reaches a person and he rejects that. Yeah. Yeah. MashaAllah, some genius just called me. <laughs> right, so great. <laughs> on that too, on Facebook. <laughs> so that means they must have seen that he's live. I know, let's just call him. <laughs> right, so. Say that. Is it, is it back on? But I think it's going to have to start fresh. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's another share now. Right, so. Yes, so Imam Ghazali has a book on. Uh, he has a book on explaining that the Christians um, that were part of the Roman uh, Empire or other kind of in Christendom, those to whom the message of Islam reaches in such a distorted manner, and they reject it. Are they answerable? And he said he doesn't believe that they're answerable uh, because the, the faith has been distorted. I would definitely say, uh, sorry folks, those of you just logging back on, that's because we're disconnected. Um, I would say that that definitely applies today. The message of Islam has by far been distorted. So people generally are excused by default. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't speak about the faith, but what it means is that for people finding the faith to be nonsensical, that's because it's presented in that image. It, it is, unquestionably. The media has a lot to do with it as well. But then we don't help ourselves either as Muslims. Like... The recent Asia Bibi case and these kind of things are good examples of, you know, Muslims taking to that meme, mm, you know, like, uh, oh, blood, <laughs> let there be blood, you know, what this kind of like, this thirst to, to, so it's a very distorted kind of image you can imagine. So I do feel, and I'll tell you something even greater than that, Allah, I'll do better than Imam Ghazali's quote here. Better than Ghazali. Sorry, sister. Right, so Imam Ghazali had said that. But better than him on this mas'ala. Look at everybody thinking, what could this possibly be? <laughs> I better quickly make up some stuff now, just to, just to live up the hype. <laughs> right, so, is Al-Qadi Al-Baydawi, all right, from the Hanafiya people, see. Now, Al-Baydawi, in his book, on, uh, in his, uh, I believe it's the Tawalit, is it? Right, so in that book, he discussing this mas'ala and, and some scholars before him as well. And Baydawi agrees with it. Other people have highlighted this as well, Al-Ubbi and other people in their tafasir. But uh, that if a person just see, like he tries to reason and tries to uh, think that is there a God? Like somebody asked me this question before that what if reason leads you away from God? That what if somebody does reason and the result of their reason is now nah, Islam ain't true. Then he writes that Al-Kafir that does that, that does his own ijtihad, he says, Yurja afuhum. That that is, that inshallah that person is fine. That he tried his best. And so even if reason does lead you away, but it's what you have, so that's actually a very interesting, and it's amazing that these quotes exist by scholars who are reputable, that are often quoted, yet these kind of quotes won't be shared with people. Just eternal damnation, eternal damnation, these kind of quotes. And coming back to uh, Maj's question on the, what about the, the punishment not being commensurate? Well, a lot, I've said this before, because Allah threatens in the Quran with punishment he doesn't have to carry through that punishment with anybody and whether it's a kafir or a Muslim he doesn't have to and many of the theologians have discussed this before um, they call it khulf al wa'id Allah when he threatens something he doesn't have to go through with it and that's another act of karam of kind of like not karam the Hindu <laughs> tera karam <laughs> Not that uh, karma, but it's another act of kind of kindness from Allah. 
So, and, and Fakhruddin al-Razi mentions in his tafsir that we believe Allah can forgive everybody if he wants. So these kind of things are, but the, unfortunately these things are never shared with, by people. And then what you have is this very dogmatic approach that is shared. But yeah, so, but that's a good, good question. Now, many question. What about oh, brothers in the back thinking, ah, just gathering questions, but gathering their thoughts, but not. I've had my hand here for like. Allah, that's, that's, like, a, that's, that's like a karate <laughs> chop about to come down. <laughs> yep, go for it, go for it. Uh, if the Quran is غير مخلوق, غير مخلوق. Yeah, and but the. Yeah, guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, carry on, sorry. But the, the language is where Mahluk, uh, sorry, I mean, the it's language mahluk. is Mahluk, yeah. and the language is part of the Quran, and how does that... Yeah, sorry, that's the wrong music again. <laughs> how does that, like, make sense? So, how, let me rephrase the question, if the Quran is uncreated, is ghair yeah. makhluk but the language is makhluk is created yeah. then how does that how is that reconciled yeah the language ah. is part of the quran isn't it ah. and then how ah. the the idafa the idafa as well <laughs> okay i don't know how the to construct use. phrase whoa words, so no 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 that's good this you know this whole speech this whole <coughs> debate of the Quran is uncreated and stuff like this. this is nonsense. This whole debate is pathetic, stupid. Um, it's caused uh, a lot of unnecessary confusion and it's rendered Muslims, exposed Muslims to vulnerabilities they didn't actually have. And this is what I said earlier. So this whole argument of saying that this, this is him the Quran is God, but it's not God. It just renders Muslims incredibly vulnerable. It makes no sense because I, I have never met a Muslim that actually understood this argument that the Quran is uncreated. Nobody understands what the hell they're on about. They just pretend that they understand what they're reading. It's incomprehensible. This is why Imam Shawkani writes that this masala doesn't make any sense. You don't have to believe the Quran is, uh, what is it, uncreated. He says you can believe whatever the hell you want if you want on this topic. None of it makes any sense. That's Imam Shawkani. And the whole point is because, because Imam Shawkani was at least just being real. He was saying that, look, believe this or believe that, who cares? It doesn't, none of this makes any sense. So I would say that people, this was never taught by Allah. It was never taught by the Prophet. It was never taught by the Salaf. This debate came after the Salaf. It came, you've got, in the time, it's popularized in the time of Imam Ahmad, although I'm sure other people as well in his time had said it, but that is after the Salaf. So, I mean, this was not something the Prophet taught. I always say with Aqidah, with, with faith, keep it simple. Keep it to what the Salaf believed. What the Quran and Sunnah that we just believe in Allah, you know the basic thing we believe in Allah, we believe in, uh, uh, you know, was to to be warusuli wal yomil akhir and things like this. I believe in revelation, in prophets. I believe in an afterlife. I believe that and these kind of things, and that's it. Like we don't need to all this creed. It trips you. It may give you some kind of power and in institutionalization, but along the way. If other people are clever enough, they can easily catch you, catch Muslims out. Sifat was a p perfect thing that I was saying that is so, it's no way in the Quran, no way in the Sunnah, this belief in Sifat. You know, today, like I, I said this to, I was visited by um, a Salafi brother <laughs> and uh, I think studying in a senior year at Medina University. And we had this dialogue and I've had this with other people as well. And I've welcomed them for a dialogue on this. Any person who's learned I've welcomed them, welcomed him or them for a dialogue on this sifat. Prove it from the Quran was sunnah. It doesn't exist. So why are you superimposing a belief structure onto Muslims that doesn't exist in the Quran and sunnah? Because it's only going to trip Muslims up. By saying we believe in this 
things which are part of God, but they're not God, and they're with God, but they're not Him. It sounds very much like the opening, you know, Gospel of John or whatever, about in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and what the hell was all of that going on? So, so, so this is, Muslims end up doing a similar thing, but the good news is most common Muslims don't know about it. So Alhamdulillah. So this, you know, this that's on the bright side. Despite the fact that the clergy have tried to force this onto common Muslims, most common Muslims don't have a clue about this stuff. So, so it's so there's good news. It's good news, people. Spread the good news. Amen. Can I have an amen? <laughs> you know, there was in the debate where I can't remember it, that uh, David Wood said something, and somebody from the crowd said, "Amen." <laughs> <laughs> I thought, all right. <laughs> Salim is asking online, okay. what makes somebody a Maliki? I think he's just trying to ask, how do you become a Maliki? Imagine what makes somebody? Uh, is he circumcised? <laughs> Although technically, that's not what makes a person a Maliki. Uh, these madhabs are just ways of understanding the Sharia. They're schools of interpretation. Um, the school of Medina is referred to as the Maliki Madhab. It is obviously the Don Madhab. Uh, it is, all of them are okay. <laughs> but this is obviously epic. There's a difference. <laughs> it's like, but they're all okay. I mean, I'm not belittling the others, but I'm just saying, like, you know, you could go standard or you could go platinum. <laughs> this is a, you know, it's just, so... The, the Maliki Madhab is, um, I mean, what makes a person be part, it's just your own affiliation, I guess. You, you identify with it, you start learning about it. I would recommend anybody wanting to learn about the Maliki Madhab, uh, start learning about uh, Imam Malik, start learning about the Madhab. I've got some videos and lectures on YouTube. I've got a lecture called The School of Medina in the 21st Century. That's actually a very good backdrop to why the School of Medina is relevant in this day and age. Um, it's lengthy, it's about two hours long, so you can ch check that out. I've got a video on how to perform the Salah with Shaban, uh, in acting for us, being the model. All right, so, right. <laughs> being our hijabi model on the day, <laughs> without the hijab. <laughs> so, I've got a, a course called Ashmawiya, which is in six lectures on the basics of Maliki Fiqh. I've got a detailed course. Uh, slightly more detailed in 20 lectures, The Foundations of Islam by Qadi Yab. These are all on YouTube. You can start learning. There's other lectures. Other people have done stuff. Uh, you can just start reading these things. I will at some point start teaching Maliki Fiqh again. I, I have done a very detailed... Um, I've done some very detailed classes on the Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qaidawani in about 70 lectures. That was very detailed, incredibly detailed, but um, we will try to get them worked on and released, inshallah. But that's it. I guess it's a person's own identification. It's nothing like, you know, you don't have a badge. You do have a, a secret handshake, which I can't show you online because it's secret. <laughs> but other than that, it's all good. It's all good. And usually they just happen to have cool beards and, and a sense of style. I, don't, I think that's just coincidental. So, <laughs> but yeah, cool. Go on then, people. That's, what else is going on, man? What? Oh, hi, Asim G. <laughs> A.K.A. Prabhu. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, I was reading uh, this uh, website, about the Quran, <laughs> okay. the, the Muslim website. And some pop-ups <laughs> came up. <laughs> 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 you said Hasim was reading a website and some pop-ups came up. How do I delete these pop-ups? <laughs> Make sure they eradicated from my... The sound was a bit low, I don't know. So, uh, they were saying... Uh, Accusation uh, against the Quran saying that Allah uses vulgar language in the Quran, and then that, uh, the ayah that they present, um, Utul, uh, Utulim Ba'da Zalika Zanim. Uh, Utulim Ba'da Zalika Zanim. Yeah, so saying that uh, Allah uses vulgar language in the Quran. Um, say that again. Yeah, so he uses that just very recently, so he was justifying his swearing and stuff and uses that uh, ayah. Uh, 
um, saying, oh, this is why... That's true. Who was it? They say Walid. Was it to Walid? Walid ibn Utbah? Walid, uh, Walid, Walid, Walid ibn Maghira. Maghira, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Walid ibn Maghira. Yeah. Yeah. It's to, uh, most likely to him the verse yeah, is. Yeah, sorry. Ibrahim. Sorry? Who's yeah. Ibrahim? Yeah. Oh, no, no, of course. Did you say yeah. no, Allah? Yeah, you, you said it as a ventri ventriloquist. <laughs> <laughs> Allah. So okay. So uh, right. So the question for the the people who couldn't hear the question is no chance. People, no chance. <coughs> All of us has no chance. <laughs> right. So this is. I'm just reading a comment. The question is that. Some critics of the Qur'an have claimed that Allah swears in the Qur'an. Uh, is that true? Uh, quoting the verse, عُتُلِّمْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ Zanim, Zanim referring to an illegitimate child. I suppose, cover your ears people, the term bastard is what people are... <laughs> you know, that word carries a certain oomph with it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, so the, this, this is the term that people are referring to That is this Now, the word zanim doesn't Although it does refer to an illegitimate child In that sense As in the person being addressed in the surah Who's being so boastful His own lineage was in dispute in his time And so th this was But it doesn't, so one could say, look, the term illegitimate child and the term, using the term bastard, I'll say it again, just because of the, the buzzy. <laughs> Do not be cropping that, people. <laughs> right, so it doesn't, although they carry the same kind of meaning, but they don't, in terms of, on the scale of vulgarity, they're not equal in that sense. One does have, you could, they could equally be offensive, that, that is true, but they're not the same. One is a term that is used as a swear often, and the other is not necessarily used as a swear. So this term zanim is not really a swear that the Arabs would swear by. Like that wasn't their kind of... So they might have said something like, you know, you're... So for example, you're the uh, Ibn Zaniya, for example, the, the you're son of a... Uh, a fornicating woman and stuff like that. And these kind of swears you do get from uh, that time. You read it in the different texts that people, when they were swearing, they were kind of swearing like this. But they weren't using words generally like zanim as a swear. It wasn't really, although it does have the meaning of, it's like saying when people get into an argument or they start swearing, they don't say, you illegitimate child. You know, that that's not really a... Although that could be insulting, but that's not how people swear. They don't use that. They'll just use actual swear words. So in a similar sense, I know that Khadim Hussein Rizvi, Khadim Hussein Rizvi Sahib, Sahib, Damat Barakatuhum al Alia, right, from Pakistan, who's called for the head of Asia Bibi. <laughs> right, so I think. Um, uh, and in his famous words, so he swears online, those of you, everybody knows this, I mean, you know in his famous words, <laughs> his famous words, Dalle, <laughs> Surah, <laughs> is, is, say, right, so yeah, yeah, so he, he has these famous swears. Now when asked, why do you swear, he said, I swear, well, so what, God swears in the Quran. I think that's a stupid and dumb argument, although I don't believe necessarily swearing per se, one is swearing at somebody, swearing per se, I don't believe is haram, like people just using the F word in language, like people say, oh, you know, like they'll swear like something happened or damn, or so, that, that in and of itself is not haram in my understanding. Okay, harming somebody by cussing them or doing something, causing harm to people is haram. That's a different topic. So I would agree with, in part, with Khadim Hussein in saying that swearing is not haram per se. Although in this context, he is actually swearing to, I believe, uh, is it, uh, who is he swearing to? <laughs> Sheikh Tahir al-Qadri, isn't he, or somebody. So that would be wrong and unacceptable, but I feel generally I would agree with him. But what he 
as to using the Quran as a dalil is utterly wrong. What's your fatwa on immortality? Somebody who attributes vulgarity to God. Somebody who attributes vulgarity to God. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> I need to make that meme. I mean, these kind of things are look utter. They, they, what can a person say? I mean, this is misrepresenting this deen. It's creating more hatred in, in, in the hearts of Muslims towards God and his faith. Allah doesn't swear in the Quran. Um, that com coming back to, I'm not saying swearing generally is haram. I'm not saying that generally. One is not at people, but using words. But it doesn't, <coughs> God doesn't do it. Okay. That's the stupid. Is it kufr to say that? You see, I, I would feel that it is, it, is, it is blasphemous. I would feel that it is blasphemous. It is Gustav. Right? Gustav. Allah ke Gustav hai ye. Allah ke Gustav hai. Right? So the thing is, these people, it, it's unfortunate what they've done really. They've created like these kind of deep uh, cults who justify anything they say. And other people, they want to, like now, that's actually an insult against God. To say, well, God's swearing. But then they will say other people, like, let's hang them. Because they've been blasphemous. That's what, what Khadim Hussain Rizvi is calling for, isn't he? He's calling for executing Asiya Bibi because she's blasphemous against the Prophet. And, and God is much greater. And here, you're attributing nonsense to God. It's utter blasphemy. Gustahi. Right, so I think these people do really need to reacquaint themselves. I know I, I watched that clip where he said, Hamne now ki kitab mein padi hui. And then, no, sorry, Hamne nav, nav ki kitab mein padi hui. <laughs> Chalo kuch, or pad lijega. <laughs> he said, you know, I've read the books of grammar. He's trying to try tell people that I, I'm learning, like I know what I'm talking about. So, yeah. Anyway, that's uh, my thoughts on that. What else, people? What else are... Please debate Muhammad Hijab on the authenticity of Bukhari. <laughs> I don't think uh, Muhammad Hijab is interested in debating the authenticity of Bukhari. I don't think... Um, so far, I, when, I, when I discussed my Bukhari gate issue, the key people that spoke about it publicly, some of the key scholars, um, that some who addressed me by name, like Dr. Jonathan Brown... Other people who did indirect kind of responses like Sheikh Yasser Qadi and stuff like this, I did actually welcome them to a dialogue because they are actually scholars of that. Um, none of them really accepted. Dr. Jonathan Brown said he doesn't really have the knowledge to debate it. So yeah, it is what it is. If you wanna, if you wanna learn more on that, you can watch my video Bukhari Gate. All right. <laughs> Hashtag when the floodgates are opened. <laughs> so go on then. What else is on your mind? Yeah, let's take some online questions because loads of people are. Uh, do you plan to write any books? Inshallah, inshallah. Why not? Why not, people? What else? Let's take some online. Uh, somebody's asking before. Um, well, Rizwan is asking. Oh, Rash is online. You're doing it, Rash. Nav, was he at the gym today because he's here? <laughs> right, so Rizwan sorry. is asking. So yeah. before, before the Isnad science, how would people authenticate Hadith? Right, this is a good question because truly speaking, people, there was like a free fall. Um, there was a, a period after the Prophet in which, yes, some people just went to reliable people like the actual companions whilst they were alive or maybe their students afterwards. But anybody just started to say things like, do you know the Prophet said this? And, you know, if it caught speed, then it became popular. And there was a lot of fabricated, there was a lot of fabricated material kind of circulating. There was. Unquestionably, in fact, when Omar ibn Abdul Aziz starts his project and commissions uh, Imam Zuhri to uh, compile just the content, the mutton, not the chains of hadith, he says to him, so many people have made a hadith for and against Bani Umayyah that uh, we need to start documenting hadith. So, so much was fabricated. Amongst what kind of crept in at that time 
was uh, the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> did I did I just do a a plug right there? <laughs> For that, you can watch my prelude video and soon to come my course. Right. So, what what else is going on, people? What else? Oh, let's take some online questions here. Or why he wants his creation to worship him, though he is Samad. Allah. Why does Allah want his? That's it interesting question but I think there is some misunderstanding I think the common perspective Muslims have is God is saying everybody bow down to me I am the creator you know if you don't bow down to me watch me burn you and torture you and this is the image this is the kind of trailer that people get to see that is presented even by Muslims you know that I did not create ins and jinn illa liya'budun no, except that they create except that they worship me this in my understanding is a misrepresentation the truth is this dunya this life is really just it's a journey for for humans for for man for by man I mean woman as well but <laughs> does that work yeah it does so by man I mean the universal man as in don't assume my gender when I say man. <laughs> Referring to woman as well. So, so this is a journey for insan, for man. And in this journey, insan tries to reconnect with God. That's what this life, in essence, muhtasaran. That's what this life simply is. This verse that I have not created in or jinn, except that there's people translate except that they should worship me is a wrong interpretation on that verse the verse ought to read that I have not created man and jinn huh? <laughs> huh? That's, what am I saying <laughs> no the verse ought to read <laughs> I have not created man and jinn Ex not except that they should worship me but as a consequence that as a result of me creating them they worship me you understand it's a consequence of our realization of god and his mercy not that he is saying i have not created them except to worship that i have created them and consequently they worship translating the word the article illa differently so this Ill, illa is used in many ways it is used they're saying as to kind of do mustathna but it does come as a harfa atf it does come as many other things so what are you using now? so i'm using it here to say that it's not about it's not the illa which is the issue it's the lam that i have not created them illa liya'budun this lam people are saying is as it's a, a, like a de, it is the demand as in the sole purpose i have not created them except li for this reason that's how they're translating it but that's a wrong translation of it it should be that i have not created them and as a consequence therefore. like the, thus therefore from their gratitude they worship me and this happens on many places in the quran allah says things and this uh, so for example uh, that we uh, what is called iqtida'un nas in arabic that where a certain part is missing but understood so we said to musa strike with the stick and water gushed forth but it didn't mention that he actually used the stick but that's understood that when we said this obviously he then did it this was the consequence you get these kind of things on many occasions in the quran but what's happened is with this constant your only your only purpose in life is to do ibadah if that was the only purpose then why allah had angels allah has other means what's what's the point of giving us all this free will and saying oh the only reason is just to worship and yet Allah says that your worship doesn't even benefit me 
So what is the purpose then? <coughs> so that, to me, I mean, people can, that it, I'm not saying the verse can't be interpreted like that. It obviously has been, but I feel that's been misrepresented, misinterpreted. And as a result, it's actually led people in many ways, uh, it, it, in many perspectives, away from God. That's my thinking. But cool, what's... Uh, yeah, there's a good point there as well that uh, has been highlighted that Ibn Abbas's tafsir of this uh, illa liya'budun was actually illa liya'lamun so that they may have knowledge of me as in get to know who I am and that t kind of ties in with what I was saying this, this journey of discovery of God kind of discovering right throughout life that man is on hmm? Yeah? People are thinking, mm, mm. <laughs> 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 All right, what? Well, come on, let's take some other. <clears throat> Sajid, Sajid Iqbal is asking, Tommy Robinson uses the verses in the Quran about the, what the right hand possesses to say that this is why Muslims have grooming gangs and why they have a problem with the. No, that's, that's not true. That's, uh, you see, Muslims, it is true that I think what is true is that um, Muslim, uh, Pakistanis, British-born Pakistanis, the generation of Pakistanis here, we have got some serious issues, that is true. <laughs> Amongst our countless list of issues is also how to handle relationships, um, how we treat sometimes the other gender, stuff like this. There are, undeniably, if we're going to be honest, there are a lot of issues in our kind of communities that need to be worked on. Uh, there is a certain amount of disrespect, a certain amount of misogyny. And I think that doesn't, it's unfair to say that that actually comes solely from Pakistan. Because it seems to be a kind of mishmash culture that seems to like a hybrid thing within the UK this whole kind of that is kind of meshed into this thug life kind of culture as you find in certain music and certain things where they degrade women and speak of them oh just this just that that seems to also play a role this whole culture and yes there may be certain elements brought over culturally as well um, I think there's a lot going on and it's unfortunate and we see the, the breakdown of relationships, especially this. I could be wrong, but in my assessment, especially the, the kind of Pakistani uh, young men, uh, there's a huge problem in dysfunctional relationships. So now that does tie into some of these and it's unfair to blame the whole community, the whole Pakistani community for, for these bloody grooming gangs. You know, when you take the, the number of Pakistanis that there are in this country, uh, men, uh, let's just say as a statistic, and then take those who have been involved in the grooming gangs, they're a tiny, a tiny, tiny fraction. It is unfair, but one could argue that it is more, seems to be found more amongst Pakistani youth than, let's say, white youths. So they could statistically compare and say, although to say... Sorry. Right. Although to say this is solely a Pakistani problem is wrong. Um, just as people don't say that, for example, paedophilia is a white problem. They don't say that even though most uh, you know, crimes of paedophilia uh, clear absolute, with absolute infants and toddlers and stuff like this in this country is almost solely perpetrated by you know, middle-aged white people. Mm -hmm. But yet that, you know, it'd be wrong to stereotype. I'm saying it would be wrong to stereotype, and the same thing with the Pakistani. But it definitely doesn't come from religion. It's not that these guys get together when they're smoking weed and doing their thing, and then somebody says, hey, do you know this verse of the Qur'an says this? And they say, ah, oh, well, based on that verse of the Qur'an, why don't we go out and do these grooming gangs? It doesn't work like that. that that's nonsense. Um, although what I would add here, there are certain understandings of Islam that maybe not in the UK, but in other parts of the world do legitimize certain actions like child brides and certain people that push that understanding that that you could marry young girls which is wrong 
categorically wrong and categorically haram. But people who push that, you do then find in other parts of the world, some countries, people then say that that's fine and they have like child brides and try to say Islam says it's okay. But yeah. Sajid was also asking, what are your views on wearing a poppy? Wearing a poppy? Yeah. I think it's absolutely fine. I mean, wearing a poppy is to show support to the veterans of the World War Two, isn't it? Was yeah, it both? I was trying to say that obviously because of Britain's colonial past and the injustice they've done around the world. We're also supporting that. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's.